Thank you very much indeed. Um, and thank you for giving me this, uh, this interesting topic because uh, what we know is that we can uh, actually use beta adrenergic agents in one direction and uh, beta blocking agents in the other direction. And the idea is certainly not to be pro one strategy versus the other, but rather to choose the right drug for the right patient at the right time. And I personally, of course, use beta stimulating agent and I sometimes use beta blocking agents, not at the same time, but uh, it's good that we have both, exactly as we have fluids and diuretics. And we should not give both at the same time. Um, thinking at the adrenergic receptors, I'd like to remind you the basics. When you look at the beta letter, you see a, an atrium and a ventricle. Beta adrenergic stimulation will basically increase the force of contraction and increase the heart rate. But it will also induce vasodilation. All of this is actually helping the heart to pump more flow. With the alpha letter, when you look at the two extremities, pull them out, that will be vasoconstriction. The blood pressure will increase, but the heart may not like it because vasoconstriction means increased afterload. It's more difficult to pump. But sometimes we need to stimulate the alpha adrenergic receptors as well, of course. Now, you ask at me the place of beta stimulating agents. Okay. Well, the pure beta adrenergic agent is isoproteranol or isoprenaline. Isoproteranol for the Americans, isoprenaline more for the Europeans. Isoprel, commercial name. We use it basically in severe bradycardia before we can insert a pacemaker, right? Or in patients after heart transplantation because they have cardiac denervation. Why do we limit the indications of isoproteranol? Well, because these potentially beneficial effects on the heart can also be harmful. If you have to push harder on your bicycle, you will be tired. So if you increase the contractility and the rate of pedaling, you will be tired. So there is a price to pay and indeed, in coronary artery disease, I would try to avoid beta adrenergic stimulation by all means. In cardiogenic shock, I use it only when it's absolutely necessary. Of course, sometimes we have to, but we should keep it minimal. So when we look at the series of adrenergic agents, I hardly use any isoprel in septic shock, except again, if there is an additional problem of serious bradycardia, which is to totally exceptional. But just from the pharmacological uh, standpoint, yeah, if I want to increase flow, I will go down Dopexamine is not really used, uh, it has its problems. So I would go to dobutamine, of course, like you. And I suspect that you want me to speak about dobutamine. Indeed, when you put the different adrenergic agents on a horizontal line, we can find at the left side phenylephrine, an almost pure alpha adrenergic agent that we hardly use because it induces tremendous vasoconstriction. You may use it in the operating room for a very transient period, but otherwise, no. Noradrenaline would be our drug of choice if we want to have alpha adrenergic properties. But if we look at flow, it's actually a mirror image. With um, dobutamine, we will not really change blood pressure very much, but flow will go up. With noradrenaline, Cardiac output may sometimes go up somewhat, but it's not guaranteed by far the blood pressure will go up. So if you look at heart rate, it's the same thing. So of course we are worried. We say, ah, ha, 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 be careful. With beta adrenergic stimulation, heart rate will go up, which is, of course, true. 
Now, in terms of blood pressure, this is the fundamental equation, which is very simple. <laughs> blood pressure is determined by flow and tone. If you stimulate with uh, a beta adrenergic agent, you will primarily increase flow, but at the same time, reduce resistance. Arterial pressure may actually go up a little bit, but not much. Well, I'm not supposed to speak about beta blocking agents, but it's difficult to speak about beta stimulating and not beta blocking at the same time. With beta blocking agents, we have the reverse. And actually, the effect on blood pressure are likely to be somewhat more significant. After all, we use beta blocking agents in the treatment of chronic hypertension, don't we? Okay, now it's not only the hemodynamic effects, and you may say, what about the periphery? Oh, increasing the beta stimulation will result in increased tissue metabolism, right? And um, it may even increase the lactate levels on these bases because tissue metabolism is increased. Is it a problem? Well, potentially on a long-term basis. So, yes, indeed, once again, when we use beta adrenergic agents, it should be for a limited period of time. About the metabolic effect, I will quickly go to the other way and speak about beta blocking agents because that's really a landmark study showing that with beta blocking agents you could reduce the oxygen demand of the tissues and improve cellular metabolism. So you see, you see yin and yang, nobody is perfect. And it's interesting to go back in history and look at this study, which was published when I was a young medical uh, student. Many of you were not born. And um, it's a study on isoprel in canine under toxin shock. And as you can see, the death rate was significantly lower when a little bit of isoprel was given, either as pre-treatment or post-treatment. Of course, post-treatment is more interesting to all of us. But interestingly, when they increased the doses of isoprel, it was the reverse. Death, death rate started to increase. I think it's a very important study because it shows that dose matters. And when you use these agents in septic shock, you should keep very low doses. For those of you who were with us yesterday and the day before, we say it. If you use the butamine, use a few micrograms per kilogram per minute, and you will see an effect because vascular tone is already reduced. Okay, let's go on. My former teacher, Dr. Weil, published in 1964 this study in the New England Journal on various vasopressor agents. Interestingly, with angiotensin that is about to come back on the, on the market. Uh, it will be available in Europe uh, in a few months. Um, and, but at the same time, Dr. Cardos published, well, two years later, okay, in the same journal, the New England Journal, a paper on isoprel in the treatment of septic shock. So, which one is correct? Which one is wrong? Interestingly, Dr. Weil continued speaking about the vasodilator effects of a vasoconstrictor. You see, we are you know, really moving from one side to the other. And in cardiogenic shock, Smith uh, proposed to use isoprel and metaraminol, which is a very strong vasopressor agent. And then came dopamine. Then we said, in the late 60s, we said, okay, that's a drug which could have beta adrenergic effect at low doses, but if you need, you increase it, and then uh, it becomes primarily an alpha stimulating agent. And I don't know if Daniel will cite the same studies, but in the early 70s came <laughs> studies on beta blocking. So you can find anything you like showing that there is a place for any vasoactive agent in the management of the critically ill. One of my favorite slides, very simple, the four determinants of cardiac output. In septic shock, you cannot really play with heart rate, it's already high. You cannot play with afterload, it's typically low with the vasodilation. So we start with fluids, but if fluids are poorly tolerated, we just add a little bit of the vitamin, why not? 
And we showed it uh, back in, uh, in 1990 that it's safe. We can give a little bit of the I mean, blood pressure doesn't change, cardiac output increases, and just evaluate the patient's response. Look at the skin, look at urine output. Look, in, look at the uh, mental status now that we no longer use sedative agents in shock. Well, with the surviving sepsis campaign, we could not make a strong recommendation. So we wrote, we suggest, weak recommendation to use the butamine in patients who have evidence of persistent hypoperfusion despite adequate fluid loading and the use of vasopressor agents. I like it. Oh, show me the evidence. Show me that it decreases mortality. Show me that anything decreases mortality rates in our field. We could be iatrogenic with large tidal volumes. Okay, 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 okay. But show me that something really improves survival, a new strategy. That was a study that I don't understand. Oh, it's in the New England. Yeah, 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 I know. But I don't understand why we would give levosimandan to all patients with septic shock. What, what's that? Of course it's harmful. More arrhythmias, a higher SOFA score, and a somewhat higher mortality rate. We don't want to give an inotropic agent routinely to all these patients. We had pre-courses on how to evaluate the patient, look at SVO2, yes, and I'll speak about it later. Early goal directed therapy may be out. Okay, that was too simple. SVO2 is still important. And if it's not normal or high in septic shock, and when the patient remains really in a, uh, in a state of poor perfusion, there may be a place for an inotropic agent. Now, very briefly, if you look at regional blood flow, the basic pharmacology tells us, that's an old paper, there are so many others, we know that beta-adrenergic stimulation increases hepatosplanchnic blood flow. Is it good? No. We could have long discussions about this, and we have no time this morning. It's not the right session to speak about the gut as a source of multiple organ failure. But in endotoxic shock, we showed many years ago that with a, with the butamine, we could increase flow and increase hepatosplanchnic blood flow, liver DO2. And with Daniel de Bakker, we even showed that this could be a way to indeed increase oxygen metabolism in the hepatosplanchnic region. If you look at gastric mucosal flow, another old study from Duranto showing that adding a little bit of the butamine to norepinephrine may not increase cardiac output very much, but it does increase the mucosal perfusion. And with Jacques Creter, we even showed that we could test the response to the butamine by looking at gastric perfusion when we give a little bit of the butamine. So, okay, isoprel hardly used, the butamine to increase flow, and of course, adrenaline, noradrenaline, if we want to increase pressure, even phenylephrine, if it's really a dramatic situation. Dopamine is out, even though, as I mentioned, the pharmacological profile may be somewhat interesting, but when we think at the regional distribution of blood flow to the gut, the kidney, but I like this paper, it's also an old paper, but it showed that when you compare low dose of dopamine and low dose of dobutamine, if you're interested in the kidney, perhaps the butamine is even better. And clinically, again, you know, it's our clinical experience at the bedside. We don't really need a large prospective randomized controlled trial on this. Stay at the bedside. And if you see that perfusion is altered despite adequate fluid administration, try a little bit of dobutamine and see and sometimes you see you in output coming back. Sometimes it's not guaranteed, of course. If you are interested in the microcirculation, all these things happening down there, very important. With Daniel de Bakker, maybe we'll return to that. I don't know. We showed that with the butamine, there is an improvement in the microcirculation, which is not surprising after all. It was our hypothesis, because if you open up the circulation, you reduce the distance for oxygen diffusion from the capillaries to the cells. And actually even vasodilating agents are 
preferable if you want to increase the oxygen availability in the cells. And finally, there is good evidence that I will not have the time to summarize to show that if you consider the abnormalities of uh, sepsis and septic shock in particular, increased oxygen demand, altered oxygen extraction, depressed myocardial contractility, if there are pockets of uh, hypoxia, that can further increase the inflammatory response. And by increasing flow in the capillaries, you can decrease that response and try to you know, decrease the, um, the, uh, the, um, the uh, inflammatory response. Going back to the heart, our patients are already tachycardic when they are in septic shock, and of course it is of concern, even though when we think about it, there are very few patients who develop myocardial infarction after a septic shock. You may have seen one or two in your career, but not more. The heart is preserved in shock, actually, because, and especially in septic shock, the coronary perfusion is well maintained. Because that's how the animal survives when it, when it is really very hypotensive. If you do not have this myocardial protection, you would quickly die from shock of any cause. Nevertheless, we don't want to put an excessive strain on the heart. You may speak about beta-1, beta-2 adrenergic properties. There is some evidence that beta-2 adrenergic stimulation can be bad for the heart. You could speak about the butamine after cardiac surgery. Sometimes it's positive, sometimes it could be harmful. I'm not here to speak about the patient after cardiac surgery. I will only say that if you are concerned about tachycardia, and if you do not want to have the effects of beta-blocking agents on cardiac output, I think Ivabradin is coming up. In our lab, we have some very interesting observations with Antoine Herpet, and this is just one uh, case. You can see at the top in uh, green the fall in heart rate, and you can see in violet, the second graph from the bottom, no change in cardiac output. SVO2 in blue, from, no change. So, you know, if we want to decrease uh, heart rate without decreasing cardiac output, Ivabratin may be interesting, but that's for the future. Time to conclude, many effects of beta-stimulating agents. Increased force of contraction, vasodilation, increased hepatosplanchnic blood flow, moderate increase in arterial pressure, not much, increased metabolism, anti-inflammatory effect, potentially some immunosuppression. We should not use it when it's not necessary. No routine use for it. Exactly as there is no routine use for beta-blocking agents, but that's not my topic. I mentioned I'm not speaking about pure beta-allergic agent. I think the butamine would be the choice to increase flow. You can actually put the inotropic agents on this type of uh, scale. <laughs> and consider that the butamine has inotropic effect, but does not really influence the vascular tone very much. And it could be helpful when it's necessary to increase flow, when patients have received enough fluid. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Henri. Questions from the room? Jean-Louis, if I said that um, I should use the butamine only if uh, the LV uh, contraction is reduced, as assessed with echocardiography, would you agree with me? Uh, yeah, early or late, uh, I, I, I'm not sure that uh, the term early is so important. But I think that as soon as you realize that your fluid administration does no longer result in an increase in cardiac output, and then you should actually do an echo, as you suggest, to evaluate the heart response. And if you confirm that the heart is well filled, but contractility is not that good. That's indeed, that would be the indication. So sometimes it can be quite early, maybe one hour after the beginning of your resuscitation. Sometimes it could be a couple of hours later. 
Uh, I don't think that in the management of sepsis we need to say in the first hour I do this, in the second hour. That's ridiculous because the timing varies from one patient to the other. I'll speak later about you know, the early fluid resuscitation, 20, uh, 30 cc's per kilogram in three hours. That's ridiculous because we don't want to have recommendations for the first three hours. We want to have recommendations for minute by minute management. I'm sure you agree. Thank you, sure. Okay. What about uh, replacing um, um, the butamine plus norepinephrine by adrenaline? As it is, the possibilities. Yeah, are that's another really talk by itself. I do not think so. Because um, the studies have indicated that with uh, adrenaline, you have the metabolic effect that you may not wish to see, and in particular the increase in lactate levels reflecting the increased uh, oxygen metabolism of the tissues. But at the same time, you may have a deleterious effect on, uh, on the regional circulation with a reduction in hepatosplanchnic blood flow. We all know that. When we are stressed, we know that our gut is hypoperfused. Before an exam, we have uh, abdominal cramps and a little bit of diarrhea. Uh, we, 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 uh, it, it's not good for the regional distribution. And studies have confirmed that. I could show you 10 studies comparing adrenaline to, uh, to noradrenaline plus the butamine with, uh, with actually worse effect of adrenaline. If, uh, if Anan would be here, would say, well, in our study published in the Lancet, there was no significant difference. Granted, but the number of patients was rather limited and the trend was going against adrenaline. So hopefully they stopped the study on time. Thank you very much again, Jean-Louis.